B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Wednesday, March 28th, 2018. The self-driving car is being developed, and soon we'll all just sit there and our cars will drive themselves. But after a fatal accident in Arizona, Uber has had to suspend tests of its self-driving cars, and The Guardian reveals the cozy relationship that Uber has cultivated with the governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey. Now, in reaction to the accident, which occurred on March 18th, and a 49-year-old woman was killed. Uber's uh, ability, the uh, certification, to conduct driverless car tests in California and in Arizona have been suspended. Now, I expect this to be temporary, and, uh, you know, a few more Trump tweets and uh, another Stormy Daniels interview, and most people will forget, and we'll go back to business as usual. But the business as usual in the state of Arizona is exposed in an excellent piece uh, by line Mark Harris in The Guardian today. And as I've mentioned, uh, I find The Guardian to be a fascinating media outlet. It no longer prints a, uh, a pulp edition of its newspaper. It's exclusively online. And its coverage of domestic American issues often, well, it shames the corporate media in this country. So I give The Guardian credit for helping us understand, they did a deep dive with the uh, Public Records Acts, and they learned that the Republican governor of Doug Ducey, who is an upgrade from Jan Brewer, who was just a total idiot, he has a very cozy relationship with Uber. And it dates back to when uh, Travis uh, Kalanick, or Kalanick was running uh, Uber, and uh, he was Dr. Disruption and uh, a very out-of-control frat boy CEO for this uh, well-funded startup. So they've got adults in charge now at Uber, and uh, this is one of the things that is part of the uh, Travis legacy, I expect. But The Guardian details that since 2014, Uber has cultivated uh, elected officials in Arizona, and the former governor, Jan Brewer, vetoed legislation that would have exempted them from insurance regulations imposed on traditional taxis. But when the change of the guard occurred and Doug Ducey took office, things changed dramatically. Uh, Almost a month after being sworn in, Ducey met with David Pluff, the former Obama political advisor who had been hired by Uber as a senior vice president, and it appears they've gotten along great. Now, the one omission in this article that I keep scratching my head about is The Guardian doesn't report on what kind of campaign contributions have flowed from people related to Uber to Doug Ducey's campaign accounts. (laughs) And maybe that's going to be part two, or perhaps an enterprising reporter elsewhere will pick up on that. But uh, that's the open question I have here. So in June of 2015, Uber opened a customer support center in Phoenix, bringing 300 jobs to the city. They got Ducey to show up at a press conference, and they even got him later to tweet a a message that had been composed by Uber. So when Uber launched its Eats food delivery service, they got Ducey to uh, tweet out a comment, and he did it verbatim. He tweeted, great to have at Uber Eats in AZ. Embracing the sharing economy makes getting fresh food at the tap of a button possible. So he's like a paid endorser or maybe just a volunteer endorser of Uber. But when Uber decided to begin test driving the driverless cars, well, Doug Ducey supported it, but he didn't alert the citizens of Arizona. He secretly accepted notification from Uber that they would begin uh, testing of some self-driving cars. Then, when San Francisco booted Uber's robot cars because, well, they had clipped a pedestrian uh, in a, uh, who had the right-of-way at an intersection, uh, well, they just put all those uh, vehicles on a flatbed truck and shipped them to, to Arizona. And Ducey 
issued a statement when that happened. Arizona welcomes Uber self-driving cars with open arms and wide-open roads. So he had to tuck his tail between his legs after the accident, and he did uh, uh, suspend the uh, approval for Uber to conduct the testing in Arizona. But we don't have a timeline on that, and it just shows how elected officials can glom on to corporate power centers. And again, the big question is, how much money has Uber and people connected to Uber managed to put into Doug Ducey's campaign uh, account? Breaking from the New York Times today, a story based on leaks from the investigation of uh, Bob Mueller. The report is that the lawyer who quit last week from the Trump legal team, John Dowd, had broached the idea of pardons for Michael Flynn and Paul Manafort. Now, the timing of this becomes important because the implication is that this could have been a dangle to try to prevent Flynn and Manafort from turning on Trump. And so Dowd, by the way, who denies that he has ever discussed pardons with uh, these individuals, He reportedly had a conversation with Flynn's lawyer, Robert Kellner, about the time that Dowd took over last summer as the president's personal lawyer. And ultimately, Flynn agreed to plead guilty to lying to the FBI in December. Now, Dowd has said that he didn't know why Flynn had accepted that plea. He said he told Kellner that the president had long believed that the case against Flynn was flimsy and was prepared to pardon him. Now, with Manafort, the discussion apparently occurred in October. Again, this is based on on leaks, and uh, I I have to emphasize that because that is the currency of uh, alleged journalism in this country today. So according to the Times, the discussion with Reginald Brown, Manafort's lawyer, was in October before Manafort was indicted on the money laundering and uh, financial crimes charges. Now, since then, Manafort has replaced Brown as his attorney, and it's unclear whether Trump authorized Dowd to have these pardon discussions, which, as I underscore, uh, Dowd denies ever occurred. But this really, I think, is an interesting example of where we are today, that the corporate media just plows ahead based on leaks and They do publish the denials of the individuals involved, but they're telling us that their leaked information is at least equivalent to the denials, if not more compelling. And then there are issues about whether this uh, is particularly obstruction of justice or whether it could be used by Mueller in a a bigger, you know, as part of the evidence of a bigger Uh, claim of obstruction of justice involving other parties and other discussions. Now, the Times reports, during interviews with Mueller's investigators in recent months, current and former administration officials have recounted conversations they had with the president about potential pardons for former aides, according to two people briefed on the interviews. These are unnamed sources. Now, who would know about the interviews? It's either the former lawyers... The principals themselves, that would be Manafort or Flynn, or people on the special counsel's team. And in a filing that is not a leak, refreshingly, Bob Mueller amended the documents related to the guilty plea of attorney Alex Vanderswan. And when he pled guilty as kind of a head scratcher, it, it's hard to quite understand. But he was a go-between between between Paul Manafort and uh, Rick Gates and, we're told, a uh, Ukrainian-Russian guy named Konstantin Kalimnik. Now, Kalimnik is not named in the Mueller document. We need to be clear about that. But the informed speculation from the corporate media, based on their anonymous sources and leaks, is that Kalimnik is uh, person A, who is described in the amended document. And it says the lies and withholding of documents were material to the special counsel office's investigation. 
Gates and Person A were directly communicating in September and October 2016. That was pertinent to the investigation. FBI agents assisting the special counsel's office assess that Person A has ties to Russian intelligence service and had such ties in 2016. That's another weasel word. The FBI assesses that. Now, this is something that uh, they might be able to determine, but at this point, we have to say that that's an unproven assertion. The Washington Post story notes that there are six words that are significant in what I just cited, the quote, and had such ties in 2016. So, the inference here is that Gates and Manafort knowingly and intentionally, wittingly, as we say, communicated with Kalimnik during the Trump campaign and that they knew that he had a background with the GRU, Russia's military intelligence organization. So this is being trumpeted in corporate media headlines, like this one in the Post. Mueller just drew his most direct line to date between Trump campaign and Russia. I remain to be... uh, persuaded about this. I think this is an interesting development. It could lead somewhere, but I don't find it conclusive uh, at this particular stage. Separately, a federal judge has ruled in the, uh, let's see, said the Attorneys General of Maryland and the District of Columbia may continue with a case that they've brought related to the Constitution's Emolument Clause and assertions that Trump has violated it with his operation of the Trump International Hotel in the least old post office down Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House. And Judge Peter Mesite said that the attorneys general do have standing to pursue the claims, but he dismissed claims related to Trump organization activities outside of Washington. Now, I find that curious because to claim that people haven't gone to Mar-a-Lago or that golf club in New Jersey in Bedminster where Trump likes to hang out in order to cozy up to him and to line his pockets. I don't understand the logic or rationale in that particular ruling of excluding the other cases. Over at BuzzFeed, a good analysis of two different pieces of gun legislation that were signed into law on Friday when Trump signed the budget. One is called Fix Nix. Nix stands for N-I-C-S, the national, uh, what do we call that? It's the registry of uh, National Instant Criminal Background Check System. That's what it's called. And there have been problems with that because uh, it, it doesn't include information on people who shouldn't be allowed to purchase a gun because of their mental health status. So, the two different bills are somewhat contradictory. One requires federal agencies to report data into NICS, while the other bans the Social Security Administration from reporting certain people with serious mental illnesses to the same registry. Now, this issue of the Social Security list was the subject of a Republican unilateral action using the Congressional Review Act that eviscerated a rule that had been uh, put into effect during the Obama administration, which required Social Security to share that list of some 75,000 Americans, at 70,000, sorry, uh, with NICS. So Republicans overturned that. Then they essentially reinstated it in the legislation included in the budget omnibus bill. But there's an exclusion for the Social Security data. And that, of course, uh, worked up Chris Murphy, Senator Democrat from uh, Connecticut. That's where he's from. Republicans talk all the time about wanting to make sure that seriously mentally ill people don't get guns. Then in one piece of legislation, they allowed 70,000 people in this country who aren't well enough to even deposit a check to be able to go into a gun store and purchase an assault weapon. So we will see if that sorts itself out. Yesterday, Judge uh, Retired Justice John Paul Stevens wrote the op-ed that we led our news and comment podcast with 
recommending that we repeal the Second Amendment. And in my 18-minute commute this morning, I heard Rush Limbaugh just uh, 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 apoplectic about it. And, you know, I, I can't imagine that his listeners are discerning enough to hear this and differentiate. But he made the claim that uh, this is only going to make the NRA stronger, that we will never repeal the Second Amendment, but that Democrats not only want to take your guns, they want to shut down the Republican Party. And, of course, there are many Democrats who support the Second Amendment and would not be a party to its repeal. But this extreme, deceptive, emotional language, unfortunately, has a lot of impact. And one of the things I meant to add yesterday regarding Justice Stevens, who was one of the four people who were on the court who voted against the Heller decision in 2008, that's the one that found that an individual has a right under the Second Amendment to own a handgun or a firearm. And the Democrats failed to capitalize on that decision. They made a conscious uh, uh, call not to contest it. They let it stand. And it is now considered widely to be the consensus view. And I think this was a serious mistake, and it's part of the corporate dominance and the poll-driven centrism that has plagued the Democratic Party for far too long. Today at PeterBCollins.com, I'm posting my interview with A.C. Thompson. He's from the Center for Investigative Reporting in ProPublica. And the interview first appeared two weeks ago at whowhatwhy.org. And this is the revelation about Adam Waffen. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to this interview, A.C. Thompson got a hold of hundreds, thousands of text messages between far-flung members of this white nationalist armed group Adam Waffen, showing that they had uh, expanded their membership after Charlottesville, showing that Adam Waffen has been implicated in five separate murder cases in the United States in the last nine months, including one in January where a young gay man was killed and an Adam Waffen leader is a suspect. That was in Orange County, California. Here's an excerpt from my interview with A.C. Thompson. This is my concern. My concern is that I believe the law enforcement community from the locals to the state investigators to the FBI are generally several years behind when it comes to tracking these groups. Um, When I look at the sort of intel bulletins that they're putting out and I look at the sort of research they're doing, a lot of it is talking about stuff from – 80s and 90s. It's just not relevant now. Um, And it's been hard, I think, for them to track this massive explosion in activity over the last two years. What I would say is I do not believe that the FBI has eyes inside Adam Waffen. I do not believe that they um, have been able to or have wanted to uh, effectively investigate the group And I think it's a a little surprising because this is a group that when they first when they first come on the scene back in the the middle of last year, it's because one of their members murders two of their other members and federal agents uh, find that the founder of the group has been compiling radiological material and bomb making material and that he's got a framed picture of Tim McVeigh uh, next to a picture of the Fuhrer in his in his bedroom. And, you know, the, the allegations at that time by by the form by a former member were that this guy, the founder of the group, was planning to blow up a nuclear power plant. So that's the, the middle of last year. Since that time, I do not believe that the federal government has effectively infiltrated this group. And I do not believe that they have, you know, I know for sure they haven't disrupted the group. As you heard in this excerpt from A.C. Thompson, he mentions that uh, Adam Waffen does not appear to be on the agenda or the radar of the FBI. And A.C. Thompson says he knows of no attempt to infiltrate them, to monitor them. And as I mentioned, during the, uh, uh, the period when Austin was being peppered with these package bombs before the perpetrator killed himself, or at least reportedly did, Uh, 
I was speculating that this could have been a white nationalist group like Adam Waffen. And we know that the FBI has been investigating First Amendment protest groups like pipeline protesters and uh, Black Lives Matter, the Occupy movement. But they don't seem to be very interested in these white nationalist groups, and we need to continue to put that pressure on. My listeners get first crack at the in-depth interviews that we post here at PeterBCollins.com especially those who have subscriptions. I want to thank Eugene Hetzel. Uh, Hetzel, I'm sorry, Eugene Hetzel. Uh, also, uh, Susan Lewis, Alice Carlson, and the fine folks over at... Uh, D- oh, I, I see what that is. I sent somebody some money. <laughs> uh, but Tracy and Cynthia and Lydia have recently canceled their subscriptions, which gives me just a minor case of heartburn. Would you be my tums? <laughs> Come on over to PeterBCollins.com and take out a subscription. It's easy. All you do is find the menu tab, click on it, click on Become a Subscriber. You land on the sign-up page, and you can choose a level of support that's comf- comfortable for you, $5, $10, $20 a month, $50 annual subscription. And if you're allergic to PayPal, here's my mailing address. It's Box 150 660, San Rafael, California, 94915. That's box 150-660, San Rafael, 94915. Well, yesterday I told you how my most recent Who, What, Why interview with national security expert and NSA expert in particular, James Bamford, that Julian Assange found out about it, listened to it, and tweeted out a recommendation that people listen to what he called an excellent interview. Well, I'm not taking any credit for anything here, but (laughs) coincidentally, that tweet may have been among the last, at least for now, that Julian Assange can send. Because the Embassy of Ecuador, where he is holed up in London, notified him that they are once again cutting off his access to the Internet. They say that he has violated their agreement not to interfere in the South America country's relations with other states. And they're saying that he has put at risk the country's good relations with the United Kingdom, the other states of the European Union, and other nations. Now, it's not clear what this is in response to. Certainly, uh, Assange is an irritant to the British government, but that is not a secret, and it's been that way for over five years since Assange has been living there. And while I can understand that uh, it does become uncomfortable to have a house guest what, what's the old phrase? Like uh, rotting fish. <laughs> uh, you can only handle a house guest for a few days. So Julian Assange is now a man without a country and a man without an Internet connection. And that's got to be a devastating blow for him. I hope that uh, Ecuador will reconsider in short order. While we're in England, let's uh, take a look at the only report that we've gotten on the health of Sergei Skripal. Now, it's been almost three weeks. It was on the 4th of March that we are told he and his daughter received exposure to this nerve agent, and they've been hospitalized ever since. We've never heard an official spokesperson for the hospital update us on their medical condition. We've seen no photographs of them since they've been hospitalized. It's been almost stone silence, except for the official accusations coming out of 10 Downing Street. So, we get the niece of Sergei Skripal appearing on the BBC yesterday, and we have to rely on her word because there there's no other information available about the father and daughter. So the niece says they only have a slim chance of surviving. The prognosis really isn't good. Quote, Out of 99%, I have maybe 1% of hope. That's kind of uh, incomprehensible. Maybe there's a translation issue there. I don't know. Whatever it was has given them a very small chance of survival, but they're going to be invalids for the rest of their lives. Now, this is news, but this is hardly any kind of credible technical-based or science-based or medical-based information. These are the impressions of a family member. And this is a kind of media malpractice. 
that is allowing Britain, the European Union, they've brought the Trump administration along. We've kicked out 60 Russian diplomats. We are hardening our relationship with Russia and amping up the tensions. Over this story. Come on, throw us a bone, give us some facts, treat us like adults. A judge in Massachusetts has given comfort to protesters who take direct action because they believe that there is a clear and present danger from climate change. This would apply to the valve turners here in the West, the coordinated effort to shut down pipelines that has led to Michael Foster's imprisonment. Some of his cohorts have uh, received suspended sentences. But in a case outside Boston, where a group of people conducted consistent protests of the West Roxbury lateral pipeline, the judge didn't allow them to use the necessity defense in the trial. But when it came to sentencing, the judge did permit it, and the court made a ruling that by reason of necessity, the defendants were not responsible for committing any civil infraction. The judge, Mary Ann Driscoll, found no liability because they engaged in a sustained effort to end the project and attempted legal remedies through the city council, the mayor, and others before they took direct action. Now, this is a local state court ruling. It doesn't have any precedent beyond even that jurisdiction, from what I understand. But it is an important first step, and I'm glad to see it. Over at the Supreme Court, the situation regarding gerrymandering cases has gotten a bit confusing because back in October they accepted and heard oral arguments on a case from Wisconsin uh, that had been brought by Republicans about partisan gerrymandering. And a decision in that case was expected by the end of this term in June. But today they accepted a second gerrymandering case brought by Democrats from the state of Maryland. And in the oral arguments, a couple of justices suggested, and Stephen Breyer was one of them, that the court should expand this uh, caseload to include one from North Carolina, but not conduct additional hearings until October, meaning we won't have a ruling before sometime in 2019. That is exceptionally disappointing because it will enable the partisan gerrymandered maps to stay in effect for the midterm elections this year. SCOTUS can uh, make room on its docket in the future for a case based on a law that was just passed in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, which outlaws abortions using the uh, DNC, a uh, DNE, I'm sorry, dilation and evacuation method after 11 weeks of pregnancy. This is a clear Uh, violation of Roe versus Wade and is a provocation intended to force the court to review the abortion decision from the 1970s. Facebook drew a new lawsuit today from the National Fair Housing Alliance asserting that uh, they have failed, as promised, to correct issues related to people who put up uh, real estate listings for houses for rent or for sale and that use the selectors in Facebook's ad software to exclude families with children, women, or people of color. The city of Atlanta is recovering from a ransomware attack that came from the murky group SamSam. The hackers were able to get into the city system and essentially shut key components down. It's unclear whether the $50,000 ransom was paid, but that uh, the ransom demand was actually 51000 uh, in the case of Atlanta. And we're told that after four or five days, uh, the systems are being brought back to life. And uh, the shutdown did throw a real monkey wrench into the operations of city government. There is a law that's been passed by both houses that sits somewhere in the White House awaiting a signature. It is called uh, FOSTA, and there's also a bill uh, that is uh, SESTA. The the two of them 
are attempting to crack down on sex trafficking that is promoted online. And as we've told you already, Craigslist has suspended all personal ads because the uh, fundamental of this law is that it shifts liability to websites that post information, say, from a prostitute or from a sex trafficker. But as expected, this is having many unintended consequences. And one argument advanced by a report in Vice News today is that the attempt to stifle sex trafficking is actually, in a perverse way, facilitating it. They talked to Alexandra Levy, an adjunct professor, law, University of Notre Dame, and she says that despite the supporters' insistence that websites like Backpage.com be held accountable for sex trafficking, there's no evidence that such platforms actually increase trafficking. While their popularity may lure in traffickers who are willing to run the risk of being caught in order to find more customers, these websites actually lead to an increase in reports of sex trafficking, not necessarily an increase in the trafficking itself. Meanwhile, Al Sharpton is about to parachute into Sacramento, which has been the scene of uh, some nasty protests for over a week now following the police killing of Stephen Clark, who had a cell phone and not a gun. And we've discussed this case in some detail, but I think Al Sharpton is going to raise the tensions in Sacramento, which is already uh, on, on a, a, a real edge these days. And this is, I think, exposing that Sacramento is our state capital. It's dominated by whites, but it has a major African-American population, which is often ignored, and they've had many historical problems with the police department. And down south in Orange County, we describe it as behind the orange curtain, There is a county board of supervisors that voted four to zero yesterday to join a lawsuit challenging the state's sanctuary law. And this is to be expected. There are conservatives and Republicans in California. I know people beyond our borders find that hard to believe. But it is really annoying that they permit themselves to become tools of the Trump anti-immigration frenzy. And I, for one, deplore it. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. It's free. You're free to share it far and wide. We post it on YouTube. And if you're there, click on that subscribe button there, will you? It won't cost you anything. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails.